Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Somewhere, some, it's going to somewhere in the cloud. <laughs> All right. We'll figure, we'll figure the rest of that out later. But thanks for that. But thanks, everybody, for coming to our March meeting. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Minerich. I am the president of our astronomy section of the Rochester Academy of Science. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see some faces. Glad to see some distant faces as well as some near faces. We got people from all over the state here. So good to see. Welcome, everyone. Um, so how this works, if it gets noisy, you might get muted. Uh, please don't be offended if you're muted. You, you can always unmute yourself. Uh, there's chat available too if you want to talk in the background as well. So uh, please feel free to use that as well. So uh, here's the agenda for this evening. Uh, we'll do a welcome. I got some announcements for what's going on. I do not have a state of the section. I, this, I used February's, <laughs> February's PowerPoint to update. I didn't take a state of the section. But then we'll follow that up with a, uh, a talk uh, by Joe Eakin, uh, uh, the director of the uh, Ho-Tung Visualization Lab and Planetarium at Colgate University, uh, mm -hmm. demonstrate uh, how they use the Digistar 7 in that lab as a multidisciplinary tool. And uh, more about Digistar 7 when we get to that point. All right, so is there anybody, this is the first meeting that they went to? They've been to for the astronomy section? Nope, everybody's it's been here. a long time. In a long time, yeah. Well, glad to see you, David. Glad you're back. All right, well, let, then we'll move on. Uh, anybody do any observing lately? I know it has not been the best of weather, but we did have a couple of, uh, uh, I guess, open nights we might be able to observe. Not exactly warm, but I'm sure. The pictures I put up on here, uh, Doug Costick uh, sent a picture. I don't know if he sent that to the whole group or he just sent it to me, but that's Orion through the trees on his property. And then Kevin Lyons did some nice uh, moon imagery. And out, this is one of the ones that uh, the moon's been to look at. Uh, has anybody caught Mars near the Pleiades in the last couple of nights? It's kind of interesting to see that. I was showing my son the winter circle, how you have all those bright stars, the bright hexagon of stars. And I almost took Mars as Aldebaran, the red giant. <laughs> so similar. That's to funny. Quality, uh, that it's, it's kind of easy to mix them up if you don't know what you're looking at up there. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, Interesting thing to see in the sky right now because they're so close together. Anybody else want to share some observing? Too cold for me to go outside. Yeah, I'm with you. Those days, those days are long gone. Even even having a warm room, I'm I'm right behind the Ferris Center, and uh, I want to do a, a star party, and I can use the warm room there, but I have to go up. In the, you know, the teens, get the, coke, the scope set up, then go back down to the warm room, spend some time in there to go to object to object. And I know I end up back up at the scope at some point or another, so I, I haven't braved it yet. We'll see. Uh, I think the next really clear night might be Sunday, but Sunday is going to be really cold. So we'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. If, if I'm moving, I'm fine, but just standing there in the cold, it's just, it, it's bad enough. Like during the day, I, I, um, I don't know how many of you know, but I'm doing a lot of uh, drone work lately and standing out in the cold when it's like eight degrees and the wind's blowing and you got to stand there for 15 minutes. I'm freezing, but yet I can go winter hiking up in the Adirondacks and I can go all day long because you're constantly moving, but just standing there going around in a circle with a telescope. I just don't have it in me anymore. That's Sorry, hard. Carol. <laughs> I see your, uh, your cat wants to get into the, the shot, huh? <laughs> My cat's a jerk. She's just up here <laughs> knocking everything off the desk. That's their job, right? Yeah, she's chewing on my battery charger now. So, <laughs> well, we'll see if it ever gets warm enough. We actually have planned, and I'll get to this a little bit later. We plan a messy marathon for next weekend. Let's see what that looks like. Early reports look like it's not going to be a good weekend for it. So, if it's not, we'll, we'll move it to the new moon weekend in April, which will be the tenth, I think. Can, can okay, I interrupt for a minute here, Mark? Um, do you do you have a button in the upper left of your screen that says turn on original sound? If if not, can you go into your audio preferences for Zoom and there's a checkbox that says show 
turn on original sound. And then when you come back here, it will be, it should show it. And then uh, you can click it and you'll sound a lot better. Right now you sort of have a, a warbly uh, compressed sort of sound. Uh, down a little lower where it says music and professional audio heading, a little lower. No, farther down on the right. There, that there. show in meeting option to turn original sound. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you should be able to close that window. And now in your upper left, you should see a button that says uh, turn on original sound. And if you click that, you should sound a little better. I have two in the same as system. No, no, you're looking at your audio preferences. Um, up in the very upper left of your overall zoom screen, there should be a, a I, I, I can't see it here, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at your screen, but it, it, you know, that it doesn't show that your zoom controls on my screen, but up in the very upper left, it should say turn on original sound. I just did, okay, I just turned on original sound. How's that? Okay, I think that's better. Okay, all right. Thanks, Dan. All right. All right, we will move on if there's no more talk about observing. All right, so it's membership renewal time. We are pretty much at the end of membership renewal this month. I would ask if you have not renewed, please do so now. If you haven't renewed, you probably got a letter from me this afternoon on uh, getting renewed and I neglected to attach the form. So if you need the form, let me know. The form is always in the, uh, the newsletter and I could also send you a, a, a copy as well. But uh, we're trying to tie this all up so we're not playing renewal all year long. We have a, a renewal period of time and that's what we'll use to renew. And then you can, uh, we'll, go out, we'll go forward from there with, uh, with the people that are there. It just gets very tedious trying to keep renewing people all year long. And, uh, it's it's a, it's a very simple process to renew. So let's just get it done at the beginning of the year and move on to our regular stuff. So also people who hold, hold keys to our site, you have a key that you pay for annually and you can renew your key as well. Uh, the form is in the newsletter for renewals and uh, there's PayPal fees if you want to do it electronically. It's the simplest way to do that. And if you need any help, uh, please email our membership chair that, that was in our email uh, that I sent out today as well. Uh, Craig is here if you have any questions on renewal. Any questions on renewing? Looks like most of the people here are pretty current, I believe. Except Mel. No, I'm sorry, Mel. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> All right, please renew. Let's get everybody squared away. All right, so uh, I'm hoping to do a, a, a one more virtual star party. Not one more, but uh, another virtual star party. And the next one up, I want to do some spring galaxies tours. So we'll do... We'll do spring gal. There's a lot of galaxies to see in the springtime, and so we'll do a tour of galaxies uh, in a couple different constellations in the spring. Uh, the next time I get out there, there's a whole. I got a long target list to look at here, so this will be. This is the prime time of year to look at galaxies. So we'll do. A, we'll do probably more than one uh, galaxy tour if we have the, the days to do it. And I'm even thinking that instead of doing me doing a Messier marathon. Uh, with my telescope, I might do that with, uh, with the C14. We'll do a virtual marathon, virtual Messier marathon that night if we can't get out to the site. So we'll, we'll see how that works. All right, so upcoming events. Uh, we'll have a board of directors meeting on Wednesday next week. Uh, if you're not a member of the board of directors and you want to come to that meeting, virtually any ASRAS member is welcome to attend our meeting. We do it virtually, so it's easy to do. If you're interested, please email me. My email is on virtually everything you get from ASRAS, the astronomy section. So please email me. I'll send you a link to the, uh, to the board of directors meeting. We'd be glad to have you and have any input you want to bring to that meeting. That's Wednesday at 7 o'clock. The following weekend, next weekend, we'll have an open house at uh, beginning at 12 p.m. The, the uh, Ferris Center will be open. We'll make sure that it is plowed now. It's, it's actually in pretty good shape right now. Most of the snow has melted that's on the roads. Uh, we're observing COVID protocols during any get together. Uh, that's actually the next slide here. 
Um, and that's where we, we ask people to sign in when they arrive uh, so we can do contact tracing in the event that there is a, a COVID case that's reported. We observe six foot distancing. We mask if we're not gonna observe those six foot distancing. Uh, occupancy of the buildings is at 50% or less. If you're, in, you're using an observatory, no more than four people in those big observatories. Uh, I put both bathrooms will be clean, but really only one bathroom will be used that day because we're still on winter schedule. And just that downstairs bathroom with all in the utility room is the only one that'll be available that day. And, and we'll observe protocols in the bathroom. Those are all here as well. So, uh, and we use these for all of our events that we get together. It's been pretty uh, successful for us to use these this way so far. So we're gonna continue with, uh, with that as long as we're safe, we can continue to meet. So let's stay safe. That same day, we'll have a, we're gonna plan a Messier Marathon. Uh, I'll have, um, if you don't know what you're doing with the Messier Marathon, that's fine. Come on out and join us. I'll have uh, sheets to help you try to find things in the sky. I'll list in the order of the, what you want to try to do them. Um, if you have a scope, bring it. Uh, we have scopes on the hill. We have targeting tools. Uh, and if you, you don't want to stay the whole night to do this, really, if you want to see all 110 objects, it's a, it's a night long thing. That's why it's called a marathon. Uh, but you don't need to stay the whole night to have fun. I think the, the last, you know, it's got to be most of the past few years. Uh, it gets to be about one o'clock in the morning. We've had just about enough because it's a long time to wait for more stuff to come up at that point. So, uh, hot chocolate time. Pardon me? It's hot chocolate time. It's hot chocolate time. Well, it happened to me last year. I went in for hot chocolate. I came back out and the skies had clouded over. So we were done. Uh. <laughs> But you're right, man. It is all chocolate thing. Right when the summer objects all come off. All right. So our April meeting. Well, from our April meeting, we have Larry. I got a lot of noise coming through. Uh, Larry McHenry will be our speaker. If you remember, uh, those of you who were here on uh, November, Larry did a talk on the Herschel uh, the Herschel family. And uh, their whole catalog of objects that they found is a very interesting talk. Uh, it, some of you may remember Larry uh, speaking at the Black Forest Star Party. He's done several talks there at Black Forest. Uh, he's always a, 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 an engaging and a good speaker. Uh, and so last time I talked to Larry, he sent a, a list of the stuff that he talks about. He had about a dozen objects. So I sent it out to the board of directors and we, we voted on the next talk. And this is what we decided would be our next talk with the Planetary Nebula. This is all by vote. We had a rank vote. The Planetary Nebula for Messier to Able. What are they and how to observe them? So that'll be our talk on Friday, April 2nd. Um, with Bill Larry McKinley. Right. right, save the date. Our Rochester Starfest, we are we played our Rochester Starfest, Starfest as far out as we could. If you were here last month, you heard me announce this this meeting. Uh, we'll be celebrating the 30th 30th with an asterisk because it's actually a year late anniversary of the Ferris Center. And uh, thank you to David Bishop, who uh, has a, a working relationship with Alex Filipenko. I put out a very flip comment at a board meeting about getting Alex Filipenko to speak for us. And Dave went out and got him. So be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. <laughs> so thank you, David Bishop, and the relationship and the work that you've done with Alex Filipenko. He will be our, our feature speaker for Starfest on Saturday, um, August 28th will be the speaker. Friday the 27th, we're going to try to do, we will try, we'll see, we'll see where we're at this point, but it, what's promising that we'll be able to do our regular Friday events with a uh, user trivia and uh, Astro Jeopardy, a little fun evening at the Ferris Center the night before. And then we'll have a regular, we're going to plan a regular Star Fest on the uh, 28th with speakers, events, fun things to do. And uh, a featured speaker at the, uh, we've, we have secured the Ionia Fire Department to do the uh, uh, talk. We have, we'll be able to use the whole fire department, not just that big meeting room, but the barn outside. If we got to spread out, use the barn outside, the uh, inside barn where the, the trucks are held. We got plenty of room to spread out in there. So 
we should be able to handle 100 plus people easily at Starfest using the Ionia Fire Hall. So that's, that's lined up for this one. I'm very much looking forward to a semi normal watch of Starfest this year. It should be a lot of fun. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Joe Eakin. So welcome, Joe. Glad you could make it. Thank you very much. So, hello, everybody. I'm Joe Aiken, I'm the technical director of the Hotun Visualization Lab and Planetarium at Colgate University. So I'm actually gonna start sharing my screen right away if that's all right. All right, so the talk is actually gonna be broken up into a couple of different parts. So I'll try to kind of get through this first part, just talking about uh, what we do here at the Visualization Lab and um, how we use our planetarium and our dome. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about the software. And then uh, I'm gonna show off some of the software itself and we'll go flying around a bit. So um, I'll start off. Uh, basically the, the, the title that I chose for this talk is multidisciplinary use of the dome. And what that means is we like to use our dome for more than just astronomy. Uh, the, the image there behind, uh, I should give a shout out real quick to David Terrazas, who built the, the, the central model of this. Uh, this is Tito Chetitlan. If you've ever been down to Mexico City and to the Anthropology Museum, uh, there's a really nice painting by Rivera that shows uh, kind of this scene. It, basically, when I first got to Colgate, um, uh, I met a professor by the name of Anthony Avini, and I'm going to talk about that in just a bit. So what do we use in our dome, first off? Uh, first thing that we do, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Uh, so here's, uh, first off, here's our kind of a couple of images of our dome. We call it, again, a dome for all disciplines. But we use Digstar 6, and this is by a company called Evans & Sutherland. Uh, you'll find a very similar software to a planetarium near you guys at the Strassenburg Planetarium. And uh, so a little bit about what Digistar is and where it comes from and who ENS is. Uh, so I'll do a brief history. So they've been in the business for quite some time as far as graphics go. Here you can see an image uh, in the 1960s, uh, one developing the first sketch pad, which is the first computer drawing system. Uh, there you see on the right and kind of on the bottom there, uh, the first VR headset. And so we've actually been getting into the production similar to that with 360 video and VR production. It's been around for decades, since 1968 or so. So they've been in the business quite some time doing these type of innovations along with flight simulators. Uh, one time, I believe they were in a direct competition like with Silicon Graphics at one point. So uh, they started off also developing 3D models and vector graphics. So here in the 70s, they developed the first computer model uh, using uh, the, the, the first hand, if you will, called the ENS hand. This is back in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, around that time, uh, they uh, since they could do kind of vector graphics, they got into astronomy. And the first digital planetarium worldwide was set off in 1981. This is not gonna be a total kind of, um, history of ENS, just more of the highlights. So I'm leaving a lot out here. So fast forward a little bit. So here's the uh, actual Digistar 1. It was able to display very basic vector graphics and star fields in a single color. Uh, they chose green. It was actually the brightest. Uh, so they basically had a CRT projector, a uh, fisheye in the middle. And then you can see the old Unix system way back when. Uh, they also did the... Uh, Graphics and vector graphics, I'm sure everybody's seen this, uh, Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan. They did all the computer screen graphics and also the star fields at the beginning. Uh, again, so they, they were kind of really starting to get into it. So fast forward uh, several years, in fact, a little over a decade, and this is Digistar II. This is actually the first planetarium that I worked at. Uh, we used a Digistar II at the University of North Texas. That was uh, 20 years ago now, back in 2000, 21 years ago, oh my gosh. So very similar, uh, just a little bit better uh, graphics as far as being able to do animation and vector graphics uh, and add that third dimension. And it also used kind of this green CRT in the middle and had a sun spark station as its control system. 
So just kind of a rundown. Uh, so fast forward, the first full dome system developed by ENS was in 1996. They had what was called a Star Rider system, uh, one in Pittsburgh, also one in Chicago. And this was the first series where they could take uh, multiple projectors and stitch them together to make kind of one seamless image on the dome. I wouldn't say seamless because there was very thick steams uh, at that point. Uh, during that time, uh, you, you also had uh, SkyScan developing uh, with SkyVision. A couple other uh, companies also started coming around developing full dome systems. So uh, fast forward to 2002, the first Digitar 3 uh, was developed, and this is where you could actually take real-time models and display uh, them onto a full dome video uh, system, uh, complete with uh, a very nice uh, kind of database of astronomy tools. Since that time, and you'll see the iterations there, just our four, five, six, and seven. I think they're like you get a lot of money out of us uh, because uh, they keep upgrading the software every four years or so and developing new features. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the Digistar 7 later on at uh, towards the end of my talk and we'll actually show some of the really cool features complete with uh, some terrain flybys and also sky surveys. So what's the future of planetariums? That is Dome X. This is the first LED dome that has been developed. There's one being, there's one built in China. There's also one in Salt Lake City. Um, this is going to revolutionize the planetarium business, I think. The price tag right now is several million dollars, so it's kind of out of the price range of many of us. Uh, but here's a quick little video. I just want to kind of show this. Click the wrong window. I'm actually going to bring the volume down a bit. And I'll kind of talk over this video. So you, you know, it's Cosman. So ENS recently was being was bought out by first a company called Elevate, which is based out of Dallas. They do kind of entertainment and interactive media. They combined ENS, who also bought Spitz, another planetary uh, company. That was one of the first planetary companies developed, and they combined to make this new company called Cosmin. And you're hearing to see the LED dome kind of being shown off. Uh, there's like a platform, they have a hemisphere. Uh, so this is not projection. The, the screen itself is, is, has the images built into it, and they're made up of uh, hundreds of little tiny LED panels uh, put together, and you'll see a kind of a sample of that. 8K by 8K system, and not to get too technical, that's 8,192 pixels by 8,192. And there you see kind of the, the behind the scenes of it. I have not seen it yet, but it's on my to-do list in the fall once uh, COVID kind of settles down a bit. But I believe the price tag right now is anywhere from five to $7 million, depending on the size that you want. 24 computers to run it, along with a massive server farm for storage. Hey, Joe, did I hear you right? A little bit of the GUI. Again, we'll, we'll get in there a little bit. I mean, see how thin the panels are. Joe, can you hear me? Of course, when one goes out, you'll have a nice black square, but Thank apparently you. they can be easily changed out. So again, this will change kind of uh, the nature of domes and how things get put on to the dome. And it will really kind of uh, expand the use of the planetarium. So here's a couple of screenshots here. And uh, there you can see like uh, one of the databases of, of galaxies. That's the, um, the Sloan survey on the left, or not Sloan, that's uh, the digital sky survey on the left. Uh, we'll get into uh, some real-time graphics. Uh, the thing on the right is actually a real-time volumetric black hole uh, that we can put into our new Digistar system. And there's some other kind of animation video. And then there's the actual close-up of the screen itself. Okay, so uh, back take a step back, just kind of a little bit more history about me. Uh, basically, I uh, attended University of North Texas back in 19, fall of 1999 as a freshman. I took an astronomy course, fell in love with it, of course, uh, you know, being a lover of astronomy anyway. Uh, 
it, the planetarium kind of combined all my interests in computer science and um, astronomy. So uh, I asked for a job and they were very nice to give me one. And so I started off giving uh, shows to school groups and to the public, and then eventually uh, programming the Digstar 2 system and producing shows and also running astronomy labs uh, throughout my tenure there. And you, you notice I was there for a little over four years, actually, I was a 50, uh, two year senior, uh, five years, because it kept changing my major. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. So fast forward, my first uh, real job was actually at University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, and it was my, we had a, a Digistar 3 and a 60 foot dome, uh, roughly 170 seats or so. Again, was the uh, main producer uh, for that facility. And then fast forward 2008, landed at Colgate University. Uh, here you can see our dome uh, on top of the Robert H. and Ho Science Center. Uh, and where basically it's a almost a one man show. I have a lot of help though with students and we employ roughly 15 to 20 students a year to help develop programs and develop productions to actually giving presentations to outreach and school groups. So uh, part of that, I'm not gonna kind of focus on the outreach or, or the public shows. Uh, one thing I do wanna talk about is actually using it for courses. And we have a lot of collaborations that we do across campus. Uh, the first year that I was there, I actually did a little tour around and talked to many departments around campus, trying to get them interested in using the space uh, for a variety of content. And like I said before, the first person I met when I got there was Tony Avini, who was on his verge of retiring. And then uh, he was writing a book as he does almost every year. Uh, I don't know if you uh, know him. He has he actually started out in studying T. Tori stars way back in the 60s. He could tell the story much better and I will not uh, uh, dishonor him for, for telling a bad version of it. But basically they looked outside in our wonderful winters that we have and said, why are we stuck here at Colgate? We should travel. And so in January, uh, they started uh, trips and the students were kind of looking for a place to go and they, you know, what better place in January uh, to escape the wonderful white fluffy stuff to go down to Mexico. And so he started taking trips to Mexico because they heard about some buildings and alignments uh, to the stars and they went down to actually measure it. And uh, hence the field of archaeoastronomy was born. He was actually one of the founding uh, members uh, of the field of archaeoastronomy. And so we, when I met him, we were chatting and he goes, well, I'm gonna teach a course in the dome. And that lasted for 10 more years. And we taught a course called Astronomy and Culture where we looked at many different uh, cultures across uh, the planet, uh, not only the Western side, but we went to the East and talked to, uh, about uh, ancient China. And we developed content to show planetary conjunctions and the change of dynasties. We visited Peru to look at dark cloud constellations and uh, actually used it as a research tool to determine some alignments uh, that involved the llama here drinking the water and comparing it to the rainy season. And of course, we went to Mesoamerica and we visited sites uh, like the Maya and the Aztec and uh, kind of showed how they used the sky and embedded it into the culture. It wasn't the same way that we do in the West. It wasn't just looking up the sky and figuring out why things move the way they do. They didn't really care about that. They knew that they moved a certain way and they wanted to embed it in the culture. So that's what we taught the students is trying to strip their mind away from the Western point of view. And that was the whole point of that course. So we developed a lot of different content, a lot of different modules uh, and made them interactive. Uh, these are some of the books that we actually use, again, all written, of course, by Tony. Uh, so The People in the Sky was the book he was actually writing. He actually has two books that might be interesting for you. Uh, one is called uh, Star Stories, uh, which just came out uh, two years ago. And then the one that's coming out now is called um, Cosmologies. Uh, I believe uh, comparative cosmologies, something like that, but talks about kind of a different cultures cosmologies. And it's a very good book. It's actually coming out in April. So uh, I'll explain a little bit of this like circle shape here. So in the dome, of course, we like to project uh, in, in hemisphere or fisheye. So this is what you're seeing here. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving here. Uh, the, the top of the dome or the center of the image will be the top of the dome. Your sweet spot will be kind of down here in the front. 
and it kind of gets wrapped around you uh, as you sit back in the seats. And so this is the model of, again, Tenochtitlan, uh, showing the alignment of the rising sun on the equinox. And it happens right between those two temples there, right in the middle. And uh, thanks to David, actually, uh, he's also, as you guys know, he actually uh, built the model. He helped us out early on uh, when we first opened up. He did some shows, some plant time shows, uh, helped out with school groups, and also got into some of the production side. And we couldn't have done it without him. Uh, that's for sure. So thank you, David. So there's just a couple of close-ups. We had a student actually take his model and then expand on it using Rivera's painting as kind of inspiration uh, and to kind of build out the rest of the city. It was Tenochtitlan is basically underneath Mexico City, uh, was more like Venice uh, than what it looks like today in the desert. It was actually the, uh, a large lake and Tenochtitlan was sitting right in the middle of that lake. Of course, the Spaniards then uh, drained it when they arrived. Uh, <laughs> arrived as a light turn. Anyway, moving on, but here's a close up of the central complex with Templo Mayor there at the center with the sun rising between those two temples, ball court there in the front. And so uh, again, the students really got a kick out flying around in this animation. Uh, these are some close up of these dark cloud constellations when we visited Peru, just kind of showing some examples of uh, kind of the artwork that we produced. These are four cardinal directions uh, for the Chinese sky, uh, we actually developed four zodiacs or three zodiacs as the Chinese had. They, you had the uh, four cardinals uh, devoting to different houses, different directions. We had the 12 solar zodiac that a lot of people know about today. And then also the 28 lunar houses, which are parts of the animals uh, of these four cardinals and all had to do with the emperor. And so we showed different alignments uh, from the Forbidden Palace. We do a little flyby of that uh, 3D model along with uh, showing the cardinal directions, comparing them to uh, different planetary conjunctions and comparing that to the change of dynasties. And students have to figure out if there's a correlation. And uh, so they take data from the dome and then go back and do the readings and determine that. Uh, another thing that we've uh, pride ourselves on, uh, one is we did a one of the first ever ceremonial landscapes uh, symposium. Uh, we had tribes from represented from the entire Northeast, uh, as you can see them listed there. And we basically talked about the importance of preserving ceremony and landscapes that have been covered in the Northeast. Uh, there's a couple of sites that uh, we use the planetarium to show possible alignments, especially with that of the Milky Way. And it turns out that water was very important. And we learned that during this meeting that uh, it wasn't just looking at the sky, but looking at a reflection of the sky through the water. And, uh, and so we, this meeting was actually very, very useful, not only for us, but also for all the tribes, because they, they have not come together before to talk about this. So uh, we, had, we had another one planned, but of course COVID happened. So we'll be doing this again, hopefully in the next year or two. And so uh, on to some other examples. And again, another archaeoastronomy. Uh, Tony, of course, eventually retired. Uh, he started teaching back in 1962 and lasted all the way to 2018. So over 53 years at Colgate. And so they, of course, how do you replace someone like that? So they replaced him with two people. One of them was Santiago, there are actually a couple, Santiago Juarez and then his uh, spouse, Kristen. They actually hired Kristen, Santiago came as a package. Uh, Santiago does uh, research in the Maya country, uh, especially in uh, what's called the community of Mezabac, which is near Chiapas. And there's a new site that was uncovered. Uh, so here you can see it on the map. This little tiny village uh, near Chiapas and uh, most of it is still buried in the forest and the rainforest uh, has not been uncovered. So we used LIDAR. Uh, he actually, uh, early on, he took a drone and flew over and took some LIDAR imagery. And lo and behold, there was uh, structures underneath many of these mounds. And so we brought it into planetarium to, to do an alignment. And you can see one of the dig sites. And uh, so here's this alignment. And he had a hunch, you know, looking at other sites, there should be alignment with the Milky Way towards the city, the axis of the city. And then certain buildings, certain structures should have alignments to the stars or to the sun. So we used our planetarium to actually determine that indeed there were alignments. Um, so he, here's one alignment. This is actually, we took the LIDAR map, mapped it onto the terrain of our Digistar. In this case, it was Digistar 6 that we used. Uh, and we 
crank the clock back to the, the, the site was actually predates the classic Maya. This is pre-classic. So this is very old. And it turns out that the summer Milky Way lines up exactly with the north-south axis of, of the site, right? from the complex. And then right over here, way back this little marker is actually a cave. And it turns out that uh, uh, that was a big thing in some of the Mayan uh, cities. They would actually have a cave and align the city up to that cave with the Milky Way. And it was supposed to connect the sky with, uh, with the ground in the community. So there's another site here or another image. And then we find another possible alignment with that of uh, an east-west alignment with another cave uh, to kind of um, look at possible rising settings of uh, different parts of the sky, ma mainly the uh, summer solstice, sunrise, and set. So uh, another use case that we use for our dome, and that's, in this case is Mike Lorante, we use again for drone mapping and remote sensing and map it onto the dome. Mike Ranti is a professor of geography who studies the Arctic and permafrost. So uh, uh, we're actually working on a, a climate change show over the next couple of years. And uh, his main area of research is actually in Siberia and uh, Alaska. And so we were actually able to show onto the dome. Uh, so first off, let me show you kind of where uh, this is located. This is far north Siberia. Uh, you definitely don't want to go there in the winter. You really don't want to go there in the summer because of uh, it's basically a giant bog in the summertime with wonderful, almost people eating flies, <laughs> massive. Uh, so usually spring or fall might be a good time to go. So he actually took his drones and did some uh, photogrammetry and lottery mapping of the terrain. Uh, this is what came back and we were able to map it onto our dome into the image to see kind of uh, erosion and permafrost basically thaw uh, that wasn't happening before and you create this runoff. And then they also grabbed uh, one of our fisheye cameras array. We will take a couple of pictures. Again, he had the students do all this. So there you can see, uh, compare the, the LIDAR data to the real image. And then of course we did uh, aerial mapping. Uh, so this is a site that there was a fire and the forest was burning there in the, in the north. All that is kind of charred land back here. So what they had to do, they came in with bulldozers and dug out a trench to stop the spread of uh, the massive fire. And that actually shows up in the remote sensing data. So we're able to, again, use this as almost a GIS tool. Well, it is very much a GIS tool onto the dome and able to fly around and see different vantage points. So you can't really normally see uh, on a screen because you can only get like one or two people around the screen. We're able to do it for entire class of students. And uh, uh, I'll show a couple more examples. Uh, this is Joe Levy who uh, studies Mars and uses Antarctica to actually study conditions similar to that of Mars. They took some LIDAR data from a plane and map the dry valleys down in uh, Antarctica. And so here you can see them kind of mapped onto the Digistar terrain. And we'll go flying in to show uh, kind of micro features. So the resolution of this is, is two feet. So uh, two feet resolution, which is extremely highly detailed, especially when you want to look at micro boulders or some type of erosion, uh, looking at these dry valleys where you have uh, enough ice melt and they kind of move things around uh, and actually get liquid for just a bit in order to make this erosion. So here you can actually see uh, some of that uh, on the terrain there. And as we close, here's another kind of uh, glacier melt uh, moving these kind of uh, uh, micro boulders. And uh, the students actually published a paper this past year studying the micro boulders on Antarctica, comparing those that, uh, that they find on Mars and determine uh, how these uh, boulders and how things move on Mars when you know, there might not be much liquid water. But so how do they get kind of the, the gullies and stuff to, uh, to match that that we find here in Antarctica? And so that paper was just released. They're actually giving a talk to the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society next Wednesday. Uh, I can share that uh, with you guys uh, after the talk if you're interested. So again, this is just some of the close-up images of uh, 
that data. And then here's, this is actually kind of fun. It showed up in the LIDAR. This is the NSF uh, McMurdo station. Uh, this is where the scientists stay uh, when they go down. There's a, you know, it's kind of hard to tell on this, but th there's bunkers and there's like uh, all these different kind of warehouse buildings, uh, power plant back here. And so it's kind of a mini contained city, uh, which is the only thing that's there pretty much for uh, on the ice sheet. And then you can see really one of those valleys kind of coming in when these streams and melts. And there's the plane that they used, which is kind of fun. And the real image kind of compared. And of course we use it uh, as many planetarians have found out that it's a really great way to use it for art and our history and a way to combine art and science. Uh, we did a show just a couple of years ago before COVID. It was a kind of a space opera. It was really weird, but it was really cool too. <laughs> so we really enjoyed it. We had a visiting professor uh, stay for throughout the semester for, for almost a year working on this project. We use a variety of tools. Uh, so the, see a question, what music, uh, the, the music was, was his own making. And uh, it, like you said, it was uh, quite interesting, I should say. It's, you know, kind of a, um, take on science and, and art and kind of mixing the two together and kind of, uh, well, you'll have to listen to it <laughs> to, to really get a sense of what, what it was like. But uh, we created visuals for the dome. We used a program called Touch Designer and mapped it into our uh, planetarium system to actually show and control things in real time and break up images. We had fog machines. Uh, we only set the alarms once. <laughs> the smoke alarms because someone left the door open. Uh, we actually covered the entire planetarium and mylar. You can kind of see that kind of around the dome here. Uh, so everything was very reflective. And it was kind of a really cool uh, show. And of course, that uh, classic. So this is just a quick snapshot that I grabbed of a show where we killed Socrates. Uh, this is called Socrates' Last Days, or Socrates on Death Row, and where we talked about the last days of his life. And uh, we created a 3D animations and models of Athens and film an actor in green screen and put them up. Uh, and so we still show that to our uh, 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 classics departments and to some of our core classes. So uh, before I get to that slide, I got to show you Digistar. So just those are just kind of some of the samples and examples that we use, uh, how we use our dome. So let me just crossfade over here to our Digistar. So we set it up. Here we are at uh, Colgate University, kind of looking southwest. And there you can see the sun setting. If you haven't seen a uh, digital planetarium before, things have quite changed from just showing the sky, uh, especially with this Digistar 7, which has actually volumetrics uh, built into it in real time models, almost like a giant video game. So if we were to just let ourselves have a sunset, you will see the colors. So as we watch the sun, if I can spell properly, and we'll see the sun sky. Now, this usually does not happen. We don't get clear skies like this usually in the winter time, as you guys know. Uh, but uh, with our system, we can clear the sky up in order to see uh, the stars. So they'll start coming in. Uh, let's go a little bit further here. All right, so you should recognize a couple of uh, groupings and stars. Uh, so I'm going to actually use our uh, Xbox controller here uh, to actually pan around and fly around and kind of look at the sky here. So as we tilt up uh, there, you can actually see Orion uh, and Taurus. Of course, we can connect the stars and see constellations and planets, but we can start zooming up. So in order to do this properly, we have what's called telescope mode, which basically allows us to use the dome as we would a telescope. So there's our little marker there. So let's go zoom in on Mars, for instance. We can get us just right. There you can see the Pleiades. Now this does not do it justice for what you could get in the real sky, but 
I'll just kind of quickly zoom in on Mars here. And there's Mars coming into view. Yeah, so kind of cool. <laughs> so we can go flying around here. Let's go back. And I'm gonna turn on uh, another feature here just as we're zooming around because the Pleiades, especially since it's right there, uh, we can layer in different data sets on the fly. And so for instance, we can set up uh, different surveys that astronomers use to look at the sky. And as you can see, this is basically many uh, images kind of built together and stacked. So as you get zoom in, you'll get higher and higher resolution. So for instance, let's go visit the Pleiades. And so as the image comes in, you get, these are again, real images, as you probably know. And it makes uh, exploring the sky much easier uh, and uh, much better in my opinion. So you can actually see real images in the sky other than just digital representations because then you can start talking about the colors and so forth. So uh, let's go visit one of, you know, probably one of the best nebulas in the sky. And that's of course, the Orion Nebula and the horse head here. And like we can start off at the horse head, as you can see, you get better and better resolution and higher resolution. And then we of course can tilt down and see the Orion Nebula. I'm not a big fan of this version of Orion Nebula, but uh, we can actually put in our own, of course. Our slow, well, you're running out of time. So David asked where these images come from. This is actually a combination of many different types of telescopes uh, and actually uh, ground-based telescopes and also Hubble. So it's actually many, many different uh, telescope images kind of put together. Uh, for instance, like here's the, Andromeda Galaxy. Let me see that. Let me just tilt down a bit. And as it comes into view, it will crossfade to actually one of the Hubble images. And so forth. So, really cool system. And I bet we can actually go flying around and, and you guys can, uh, I can take requests if you like. But let me show uh, another feature here. As good. I'm gonna turn off the sky survey for now. And actually I wanna go back in time a bit. So we'll watch the sun come back up and we can go flying around in the sky here. So first off, I'm just gonna take off our telescope mode. Yeah, we'll take that off. Okay. And let's go flying around a bit. So I'm gonna tilt the sky down a little bit. So this is of course uh, Colgate University. Uh, this is using ArcGIS real imagery. And as I zoom around a little bit so you can see it. And yeah, let me, take off here. So we're gonna fly off the earth completely. We'll fly through some clouds. And then we can go looking at different parts of the earth. There we go. So um, again, you probably wouldn't, didn't see kind of previous versions. <laughs> uh, so this is just, a huge step up. And it actually is gonna take advantage of some of the higher end uh, graphics cards that are coming out in the higher end, but the newest graphics cards, the RTX series with NVIDIA, to take uh, uh, advantage of ray tracing and it has real-time shadows. And uh, unfortunately, I, I say only, I only have a GT, oh, don't get too technical, but I have a GTX 1080 Ti, which is a couple models back, which does not have uh, ray tracing built in. Uh, of course, Rochester is cloudy. Uh, you know, our whole Northeast is always cloudy.
But um, here we can, let's go fly back down to the clouds. And then you can get, kind of see the biometrics there, but way far south down. And we'll kind of, let me bring the sky back a little bit, just so we can get a little bit brighter here. There we go. So in the planetarium, if you were in the planetarium, you would actually do this in the dome. I actually have it mapped out just as a rectangle so you can kind of what you normally see on the TV. But um, you know, if you start to get dizzy, be sure to close your eyes and it all goes away. So here, let, let, let's, let's get, uh, again, really cloudy here. <laughs> there we go. Let's go down. I had to look for the Finger Lakes uh, through the clouds there. And we can go down to Rochester. I think I got it right. Yeah, it looks like Rochester, right? Yeah, so um, again, this is all uh, data from ArcGIS World Imagery. Uh, we can also put on other data sets here if we want to do like Google Maps, but just kind of give you an idea of the resolution that we get. Very similar to what you might find in Google Earth. So not bad. And complete, if we go all the way down, we don't have 3D buildings yet. We're working on that, but we do get terrain. So what better way to do this than if we were to go to the Grand Canyon? So let's go fly around to the Grand Canyon. And feel free, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, we can also, you might be able to unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question as we go around. Let me zoom out even more to do it a little bit quicker. So as we go down there, you can see the Grand Canyon, Colorado River. It really doesn't do the real thing justice, but it's not bad. And again, we use this, we do a lot of terrain flybys and show different layers of uh, data sets on top of the terrain uh, in our classes. We have a class coming in next week that talks about uh, volcanology, it's a mega geology course. And uh, they do actually, the Strasbourg has a very similar system. Uh, they have a Digistar 6, uh, very similar to us. This is again, one model up, but it's very similar. Um, so yeah, so uh, and Steve Fentress is doing many, many shows. He's actually open uh, right now. Uh, so definitely go by and visit. It's really close for you guys. We're not quite open yet because of uh, restrictions at our university. In fact, there's a, there's a couple of shows on uh, Sunday. Uh, there's a 1.30 sky tonight and a three o'clock Hubble immersive universe at the Strasbourg Planetarium. And I'm hosting, so come on by. I'll have to make it out that way at some point. Yeah. But uh, as you can see, uh, not only can we do terrains, of course, here on the Earth, uh, we can go, of course, to any any planet that we want to or any anywhere. So let, if we fly out real quick, let's let's head out. How about we head over to Mars? So we'll zoom out of the Earth. And give me one second while I set this up. While you're going to Mars, if you come to the Sky Tonight show on Sunday, I'll take you to the Perseverance site at the Jezero Crater uh, mm -hmm. using the Digistar 6. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we can actually go there if you like. Uh, Grab it real quick. All right, so this might go a little fast here. Because I was trying to hurry up. But here, let's kind of zoom out a bit. And let me just set this up real quick and we'll head right down. So I'm just setting up the terrain to get high resolution. And then I'm gonna colorize it. This is actually, uh, here, let me zoom out a little bit. This is a global map of Mars that's super high resolution using CTX data, uh, all put together by, uh, of course, my, the name is escaping me. What a second, one second. Um, by Caltech. 
And this is a Murray lab in Caltech, uh, which is a colleague of one of our professors, uh, Joe Levy. And if we were to colorize it here, make sure it's the right one. And let's go down to the Shizuru crater. And let's just get a little bit brighter here. Just so we can see it. Wrong way. This, again, in the dome, it's, it's much more impressive, of course. But what's great about this data set is it's super high resolution. So we can go right down to the surface. Yeah, so the, yeah, this is the landing spot for the rover and for Mars, uh, for, for the Perseverance rover. And we'll get a better shot here. So there's the kind of inlet, uh, the channel coming in. And what makes uh, the Jezero crater, just real quick, you know, more special than previous landing sites, especially Curiosity. Uh, when Curiosity landed, the uh, crater that it landed in was actually a lava bed. So it actually covered up uh, if there was any kind of water-filled uh, crater. This was actually not covered up by lava. And so uh, we should see water deposits and mineral deposits uh, if they did exist. You can see some of the detail there. Yeah, so uh, basically just some of the, the samples that we can do using the star system and how we use our planetarium. It's 8.30, so I don't wanna to go too long. Uh, I'll open up for questions or anything that you wanna see as we fly around. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paula Satoraka, I want to know if you could fly through Saturn's rings. It is a pretty cool thing to see. If you go to uh, there's a, the, the original show at the Strasbourg uh, was a show called uh, Inner Space, Outer Space to Inner Space, and we took you through uh, take you through Saturn's rings on that tour. Oh yeah. And that's kind. Of, that's a really cool thing because you see these things that look. And just like Joe will show you, they look pretty solid, but when you fly through them, it's just tiny particles of dust and ice. Yeah, so here, let's. I'm doing it quick just so. Oh, look at that. You can get there really quickly. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I had a program, so we, we, I can fast forward. Uh, usually, of course, in a real, uh, real show in the planetarium, we'd be much smoother. But yeah, so here, here's Saturn. As you can see, we got real time shadows going on. Uh, and let's fly through the rings to see what happens here. Let me slow down a little bit. And we can visit some of the moons too, actually, uh, while I didn't have this set up. So I'm gonna do this on the fly real quick. Uh, let's turn the moons on. And as we get close, you can see the rocks. Uh, again, uh, let me make that a little better looking. This is set up for the dome, not for a, a screen. So the, uh, the like the ring particles are really, really big. So we can, we can actually bring this down a bit. Now that's good. For that. Whoop. Let's slow down a bit. And so we can go flying around and you see the gaps in the rings there. So I can see very, very flat compared to the rings itself. And one of my favorite moons around Saturn I love to see is, and that is in, uh, Pan. So we, we, can, we can go look at Pan real quick. One second and we'll go visit Pan.
course, it's on the other side of Mars there as we go around. Uh, Pan is just a weird looking moon. And due to tidal forces of Saturn, uh, it, it's kind of squished into like a hamburger shape. I, I always thought that Pan looked that way because it was accreting along the edges being in the middle of the of the uh, of the rings, maybe maybe either or who knows. Yeah, I think uh, maybe a little bit of both. I, I don't know if it's accreting because if you look, it's actually in a gap. Yeah, well, it, it picked all that stuff up and now it, it's it did. Band. You're right. <laughs> so it accreted and cleared out that gap. You're yeah. right. But there yeah, are those... extreme tidal <laughs> forces. Yes, yes, yes. There are very very tidal forces. It's kind of cool looking. It does look like a UFO mark. Yeah, so, um, yeah, actually, the um, there's a question in the chat here talking about the database. Is it imagery static? It's a little bit of both. Uh, we have static imagery that we can put in. Uh, we can also download stuff on the fly. Uh, for instance, the Earth, the clouds are actually dynamic, and it brings uh, data in uh, from, it gets updated once a day, but those are what the real clouds would look like that morning. And then it tries to simulate, if you advance forward in time, uh, simulate the movement of the clouds. Uh, but we can also do other things like uh, different weather patterns and map them on to the dome, look at wind patterns, uh, look at precipitation. That's a really cool thing that we can do. And then, of course, we can get uh, the latest satellite data, uh, any asteroids. We have asteroid data that we can bring in. And so if there's, no, like, for instance, new comet discovered, we can bring the orbital data uh, directly in and go flying around. Oops, sorry, I got a little too close. <laughs> so let's fly back out of the ring. So there was a question on molecular scale simulation, such as a view from inside melting ice or inside of a living cell. That's coming. <laughs> I, I think actually, um, I missed the talk. There was actually a database of uh, molecular data. So um, that uh, a site in Cleveland was putting together. And I'm not exactly sure what that entailed, but it might be something that's similar where you can actually go flying uh, to the micro scale. Mm -hmm. Sorry, as we were talking, I just kind of kept flying out. So here's our Milky Way bottle uh, you know, with the bar and everything. And so you can here you see how flat the Milky Way is. 100,000 light years side to side, about 3,000 light years thick. And as we fly back in, all the stuff that we can see is kind of right there and tucked away in a couple of spire arms. And then of course, we can bring other data sets in. Uh, this is another kind of cool thing about our system. Um, here, let me bring in uh, some of our data sets. Uh, for the galaxies. We can now a little bit here. Just waiting for my system to load here. Here we go. So we'll start off like with the local group as we fly out, the Milky Way becomes just a speck. You see, you might be able to see on your screen some of those dots. Uh, so in order to see them even better, we got to scale them up. So all these galaxies that you see uh, here, these little tiny dots are part of our, just our local group. So I'm about to turn on a much bigger database. These are all the uh, bright galaxies. Now, the problem with this data set, at least what, what I probably have a problem with, uh, some of the images are fictitious. And so they kind of just, um, uh, uh, kind of map uh, the dots are in the right place, but the images mapped to those dots uh, are not necessarily accurate because you'll see a couple of repeats. But as we zoom out, but there you can see actually a ga galaxy clusters. And if we zoom out, you might notice something strange about the data. What do you notice? Well, one, they're all uh, kind of um, coming from a central point. Of course, that's our sun, or I mean, that's our Milky Way. 
What's that? It looks like a butterfly. Yeah, kind of. Well, well, what about in the middle? Nothing there. There's something missing, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what's in the way? Milky Way? That's right. Yeah, the, the, the visible uh, Milky Way. Uh, the, all that dust we can't pierce through. And so it's actually in the way of, of this particular data set for all the galaxies. Now, of course, we can layer on other galaxies. For instance, like here's the uh, Sloan survey, uh, one of many Sloan surveys. Uh, every little dot is a cluster of galaxies. Again, we're way off there. We're about, uh, I think, 10 billion light years right now from the center, from our Milky Way. And so that gap kind of gets a little extra big. Well, the universe is definitely a sponge-like pattern. And so we can actually do that. We can bring in different data sets and kind of layer them in, uh, layer them in on the fly. It makes a very useful tool for our astronomers. Yeah, we'll fly back in here. And we'll head back home. Okay. There's our sub. Okay, we'll stop right there. Okay, any other questions? Don't see any others there. Oh, awesome yeah, stuff, Joe. Coming in. Yeah. So, Joe, how many uh, how many graphics uh, processors are you using? At the right hotel? now, I'm using yeah. one. Uh, well, when 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 you're using the dome, how many are you using? Yeah, I have four. So yeah. we, we uh, at our dome we have two projectors, and uh, they're they're dual Sony laser projectors. Uh, total is four K by four K, resolution forty ninety six by forty ninety six pixels on dome. Uh, each of uh, uh, the computers takes one quarter of the dome. And then there's a host machine that uh, acts as the go between the GUI and also uh, acts as network kind of uh, communication between all uh, four machines. Uh, in each computer, we have what's called a sync card, which allows uh, the, the computers to sync up together so that you don't get tearing along the seams. And uh, we also have a nice little system uh, where we can auto blend. Uh, using cameras. We have four webcams around the dome, uh, which used to take me hours upon hours, and David maybe can attest to this, uh, you know, hours to blend all the projectors together. In my first site, we had six CRTs, and these are those giant big CRT projectors with the three uh, colors, the RGB guns. Uh, that took forever to <laughs> align six of those. Uh, nowadays, I can do it in five minutes, so <laughs> it's quite nice, um, but the, yeah. Pretty amazing. That's very similar to what the uh, Strassenberg has. Yes. Yeah. We have a bigger dome. They have a lot more seats. Uh, I, I failed to mention, we, we have a 10-meter dome, so roughly 33 feet across at about 59 seats. So we're a very small, intimate uh, planetarium. Uh, but within that, we have a production room for students. And um, so we, uh, I have a few workstations for students to work on productions. And then a, a small render farm and also massive uh, storage servers uh, to hold all the uh, the productions because it's a lot. Yeah, and Strasbourg, I believe, was the largest planetarium in the East Coast, at least at one point. Um, I don't know. How big is the Hayden? Hayden's big now. Hayden's probably bigger than the Hayden's Strasburg. 55 or maybe I thought it was a 55 foot. Yeah, the Strasbourg is 45 feet okay. wide, 60 feet tall. Wow. There you go. Oh, well, here, I'll stop oh. sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else with any other questions? So, 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 Joe, do you, do you, on a, when things are normal, do you have uh, do you schedule a public uh, star shows that kind of stuff there? 
Yeah, absolutely. We do free shows actually weekly, um, typically on Friday evenings at uh, 6 or 7 p.m. Sometimes we'll expand out on Tuesday nights. We, we, we kind of, um, again, everything we do is for free because we, we were told early on that we could not charge for any of our uh, programs. So uh, part of what we do is also school groups. We have uh, roughly um, uh, usually two to 3,000 kids a year uh, that come through, uh, again, for free, or we uh, run school group programs. Uh, again, we can only handle, I uh, had to get limited on how many we could handle. Uh, the professor started complaining because we are in, in the middle of a science research uh, center <laughs> and the classes. Uh, so we, we had to limit that to one a week until classes in and then we do four or five a week uh, for about six weeks straight so which is a lot of fun and I and that's why I miss the most yeah I think so, there, yeah go ahead I was going to say because somebody's asking how big the dome was but as far as seating at this I think I described that already 45 feet across 60 feet tall and uh at full see the Strasburg underwent a remodel uh, and it reopened in 2019 for its 50th anniversary. Prior to that, it had a capacity of about 220 people. After that, because of the, the, the things that they had to do for to, to update it for uh, safety's sake, it was a maximum capacity of about 120. And now with COVID, uh, to keep that distancing, the most that, that the Strass can fit in in any show is 40 people. So 40 is a sellout uh, for, actually some shows is 35 because of where you gotta sit to see what's on the dome. Uh, so between 35 and 40 is the is the capacity with space between people with Strass and the Yeah, we were limited to nine. Wow. And uh, it's just like, that was it. No, we're not, we'll wait till we can reopen fully. Yeah, so we've been running like, virtual shows. Yeah. It, you know, it's not worth turning on the bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, the laser block, which apparently oh, yeah. runs out in eight years, it is quite pricey to, to replace. You're actually better off to get new projectors at that point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, Dave wants a uh, 360 dome with a plexiglass <laughs> floor. <laughs> You just buy uh, two domes and put one on top of the other, right? <laughs> you know, there's, they have a sphere in Vegas, and then there's a, a tunnel in Vegas. And I think there's one, uh, uh, I want to say, I don't think it's Malaysia. Uh, uh, maybe it's uh, Shanghai that has a sphere. That's amazing. You know where you talk about? They come out on a little walkway, and you can kind of immerse yourself in the sphere. That's pretty, pretty cool. cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Walking in space. Yeah, and actually someone asked about the LED, uh, LED dome. Yeah, it's only um, basically a, a little bit more than half a hemisphere, so a little bit more than a quarter of a sphere. Uh, again, they kind of have it in, in the big warehouse. They didn't have enough room to, to, to put the dome. And because that's at a warehouse in at Evan Sutherland in Salt Lake City, the one in China is actually a full sphere or a hemisphere. Yeah. And then, oh, Somebody asked that, how, how long does it take to become a professional operator? Um, well, I've been doing it for 20 years and, and kind of worked on many different systems, did start from two, three, four, five, and six, and now seven. Uh, but it doesn't take that long, you know, it, it's like a video game. You, you can pretty get pretty good with it after about a week. So I had about a week of training when I first started and then uh, kind of went from ever since. I'm, I'm a part-time operator at the Strassenberg and so I don't use it that much. And it reopened in 2019. I'll say only now in this two years of part-time work, am I, do I feel comfortable that I could take you just about anywhere you want to go? Uh, and even then, if there's, there's still got to get the lighting right. You got to get the sunlight shining on things the right way to see details. And there's a lot of subtle things to learn how to use it. But it is cool. It's, it's a far cry from just having a projector showing you stars in a planetarium you get to be able to really see the texture in and around planets, of other galaxies, other solar systems. We could take it to the other solar systems as well and, and, and watch sure. the interactions there. Pretty cool. And we could do custom, like a, a colleague of mine in Ohio, 
uh, I have a version of it that, that I built too. So we kind of combine some more efforts uh, as long as Disney doesn't hear this, so you may work for Disney in the, in the group there. Uh, we built the whole Star Wars universe uh, where we could go flying to Star Wars planets uh, okay. and, um, and uh, complete with 3D models and uh, music. And uh, the guy did a really good job actually piecing that together. And so you can go down to the surface of these and, and see what it might be like looking at dual suns on Tatooine and such. That's cool. Tony says you need to rescue me from the Empire. No, I'm right in the <laughs> hangar bay. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for Joe? Well, Joe, thank you so much. Appreciate the, you're describing what you're doing there. And it's really amazing. The there's got to be a lot more archaeo astronomy that can be done we just we just haven't discovered what we can do with it yet that's that's pretty oh, cool right. oh yeah no we're, we're looking forward to to getting the software up onto the dome and getting folks to see it so can't wait awesome so yeah awesome. open invitation anytime you got, anybody wants to come out to uh, colgate uh, give it a free private show of course so, a couple yeah. hour drive it's not bad yeah not bad at all. <laughs> thanks joe all right thank you guys all right Cool. Um, for anybody who's interested, I am doing shows on Sunday, and I think there's shows on Saturday as well uh, at the at the Strassenburg. Right now, it looks like the Strassenburg is pretty sold out on, uh, on Saturday, except for the Sky tonight at 12:30, uh, which uh, will take you, you know, a lot of different. Play. Everybody does a different show because it's uh, it's all done uh, extemporaneously. It's not a pre-recorded show so different presenters do different things at the Strassenburg. I'm doing shows on Sunday uh, and I have a Sky Tonight at 1.30 and the Hubble Universe at 3 o'clock. Uh, those are all Digistar shows and the Sky Tonight I'll show you what's up in the sky but I'll also take you to Mars to the Jezero Crater where the where the probe is going to be and I'll take you to a couple other places that are up. Uh, we'll zoom into uh, other places that uh, we could see in the sky uh, over the course of an evening. And then the Hubble Immersive Universe show is uh, some of that, most of, about half of that's pre recorded and will take you through the uh, above the atmosphere, show you the Hubble telescope and a little bit of the Spitzer telescope. And then there'll be about a 17 minute montage with full dome images of the, some of the best stuff that Hubble has taken images of over the last 30 years. So that's pretty impressive to see these images on the full dome in uh, 4K, 4096 by 4096 across the whole dome. That imagery is about 17 minutes long. Then we'll come back to Earth and we'll do a shorter little Sky Tonight program. You know, and you'll see a couple additional Hubble images of stuff that's in the sky tonight. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting show as well. So there's, there's uh, tickets available for each of those. And I don't remember what the cost is right now. I think it's like nine, 10 bucks for a show. And each show, each of those shows, the Sky Tonight's about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. The Hubble's Immersive Universe is almost an hour. So if you're interested, you can see the Digistar 6 in action at the Stress. My plug for Steve, who's not here tonight. I don't think he's here. You hear Steve? No, oh, I guess not. All right. Well, that's all I have for tonight. Anybody want to talk about anything else? We all got nothing better to do on a Friday night. <laughs> This is the better thing to do. Of course, Carol, of course. So uh, Paula, I'm, I'm doing shows on Sunday. Uh, there are uh, Saturday, there are some shows, but they're, they're close to sold out. I'm doing shows on Sunday, 1.30 and three o'clock. If you want to come to those shows, if you're interested in coming, let me know you're there. Come on up to this, to say hi to me when you're there. But there's at least uh, 
15 seats, I think, for each show that are available. So Dave, we miss you. We're glad to have you. Uh, come come anytime. That, that note, are you on our email list, on the general list that got the email for this? Next month's talk should be interesting with uh, Larry McHenry. Uh, if you've been to Black Forest, and I know you have, David, you've been there, David. Some of the people on here have been to Black Forest. He's a pretty good speaker. Uh, pretty soft-spoken, very, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it. It's very. It's a very approachable speaker. He's a, pretty easy to listen to. He doesn't get too too technical. And if he does, he pretty explains, uh, explains how it goes. 2002. Yeah, I've only been to, since 2007, so you got me by five years. <laughs> and speaking of Black Forest, I haven't heard if that's happening or not this year. I don't know if they made a determination. It's pretty early yet in March. If they're going to have a Black Forest star party. A Cherry Springs star party in June. I haven't heard anything about that. I haven't even heard about Neef, which is supposed to happen next month. Is Bill on? Bill Schlein? Have you heard anything about Neef? Bill's a regular attendee at Neef. You can usually find Bill at the uh, Stellar View booth. Bill's asleep. He's not answering. Yeah. So Vicki, I can't wait for summer either. Although I heard good news, it sounds like we're gonna have enough vaccine from what I heard for all the adults in America to be immunized by the end of May, which would be phenomenal if that That's just happen. gonna be great. If that can happen. We can get back to something close to normal this summer, which would be incredible. I hope so much. Yeah, that's, that's a big reason why we pushed uh, Rochester Starfest out to the end of the summer so we could try to get back to something normal. You know, you pushed it to uh, my mother's birthday weekend. <laughs> and of course, that's when I thought I'd go down to Long Island finally, but- Tell we'll her to, to come up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's likely. <laughs> or, or, or go down the next weekend for Labor Day. Then you can spend Labor Day down to Long Island. Yeah, it's not gonna work, uh, I don't know. Sorry. I know. I'm already camping for that one, but we'll see. Like, what is that? Friday, Saturday, 27, yeah. 28? Yeah. yeah, Friday, Saturday. Friday is, uh, we'll do, our, we'll try to do the usual um, Astro Jeopardy and uh, Astro oh, Music Trivia. You. That's always fun. To do. It's actually yeah. a lot more fun than, than some of the other things we do. It's just that it, intro night. Yeah. So. It's so do. much fun because we don't really have any other responsibilities. So no. it's, yeah, a really good time. Yeah. It is a good time. Yeah. No, I'll be there. I think maybe I'll have to head down on the Sunday. That's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I put in my yeah. note in the, uh, in the uh, president's message for March that uh, I'm going to work with Steve Ventress to try to do the December holiday party it'll be a different form i don't know if we're going to be able to share food and to mingle in the lobby if for no other reason mm -hmm. that the and the rmsc is not going to let that kind of event take place with that that close human interaction but mm -hmm. i think what we can do is actually schedule and we'll have to probably have to make reservations schedule a couple of times that we'll do uh, our meeting which we'll have our regular meeting we'll have the announcements like i just gave there may be some recognition there. And then we'll have um, member images on the dome, mm -hmm. which I have a whole new way to do member images now, which we can cover the whole dome with wow. member images. Yeah, so we could put up individual images around the dome and then we could we could both put full images up on the dome as well. I've kind of worked through a script to make that happen. So that could be, that would be really cool in a new format. And then we could do a, a little star show, whether that's Steve doing a demo of what's coming up in uh, 2022, or we can see uh, uh, whatever, uh, it might be an interesting star show on black holes or something. There's gonna be something new 
coming out at that point for a point of term. We can see that show. And we'll take a uh, we'll take a poll on what we want to do with that. But that that would be what we could do. So it would probably be like an hour and a half, and then another, and then we clear the uh, planetarium, and then another group comes in seating mm -hmm. you know 40 people at a time because typically we're somewhere between 60 and 100 people when we meet for the holidays and while we can't probably won't be able to have the food and the and the the closeness of that lobby area ahead of time we could split it up into uh, at least have a little bit of uh, camaraderie there masked and, and uh, share some of the astronomy parts of it could we Water even comes. try and do it on two different dates? Possibly. We could possibly do that too. You know, so and I, like sign up for one day or the other. Yep. Yep. I'll, I'll talk with Steve. I mean, we, we've got that date locked in on the um, on the third, I think it is. Don't quote me, but I think it's the third. And because uh, I, mm -hmm. I booked our dates with Steve for like three or four years in advance, that first Friday in December okay. to have our meeting. So we have the date locked in. Um, mm -hmm. But having a couple of days is a possibility, I suppose. I'll just have to, we'll just have to work that out with Steve. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. <clears throat> you can get uh, some of the notes. So Starman is uh, Bobby too. Is that you, Starman? <laughs> Is that who that is? I there guess so. <laughs> That's Bobby. I'm, next, I'm, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to talk to CP3O. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, <laughs> That's me, he says. And, and, and here's next to Alex there. There you are, next to Alex. Our guest, our guest in, the, in August. <laughs> Oops, there you go. Well, I didn't want to share, uh, show my messy office, but um, this is all the small sampling of. of <laughs> there's, there's all the Star Wars stuff, right? <laughs> That's there. a little bit. <laughs> There's not a, a space around me that doesn't have something geeky, That's whether good. Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or uh, you name it, any other sci fi. Yeah, you fit right in, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Found my people a long time ago. Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> especially the Texas Star Parties. So I've Dave, seen Joe's office. It's never that clean. No. This is my home <laughs> office. <laughs> yeah. You should. Uh, you should come to our Star Fest. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll. I'll. I'll keep you in in uh, the loop with what is happening. It's the August twenty seventh. There's like a couple hours in the evening, and then observing afterwards if it's a, if it's a, available. And then the 28th, we're gonna have a great speaker. So yeah, definitely want to come. Oh, that'd be great. That's uh, hey, August 28th, and, and that could be flexible. I'll get right to the second day. That'll be flexible. We're still working out time with uh, Alex. Uh, he's got a couple other things going on, possibly that weekend. I think Burning Man starts that weekend. And <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> So, that was my uh, second choice. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, Joe. Uh, <laughs> Joe, if you go, we'll get a mod, and we'll go. We'll all go out together. It is a blast. Ionia is awesome. <laughs> Ionia is awesome. All right, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Plan. It's even hey. probably more awesome than the last time you were here, David. It's pretty. Oh amazing, yeah, I'm. I'm, sh I'm sure it is. Pretty amazing. And you can actually camp if you wanted to. Oh, I, I definitely would. I'm an outdoor camping guy now, so. Great. Did my first winter camp in the Adirondacks, minus wow. eight degrees. Oh, that's way too cold for me. Did you stay in a lean-to or were you in a tent? I was in a Larson hammock. <gasps> no. That was cold. <laughs> no, I had an underquilt. I was good. I had a minus 40 degree All right. sleeping bag. Wow. I was good. <sighs> That's comfortable little hammock. You get a nice, you get a nice uh, sling effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 the hammock camping is the only way I go now. Hmm. When I went down to go observe the uh, 2017 eclipse down in Kentucky, that's how I camped all along the way. Nice. So the Messier yeah. Marathon is next next Saturday, uh, and then the the rain slash weather date would be the uh, uh, April 10th. 
I, I just posted a bunch of pictures to Carol of the very first Messier Marathon back in 2002. Oh, cool. I don't know how much how, how many of you guys know who I am, but I actually started that back in 2001. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was uh, my daughter, Melissa, and Neville Davey, and Frank Bove actually won the Messier Marathon that year. Nice. Such an awesome time. Yeah, it's a good yeah. time. It's fun. I've only done it once in my career. Yeah. It's, it, it's a long, it's a long night, but it's worth it. it it's, it's just so many amazing, especially within the Asrev group. There's so many amazing people there. I miss you guys so much. You don't know how much. Good to see you. Yeah, thank goodness for Zoom. At least you get to like see people and talk to them and enough like with email and texting and all that, like this is so much better. Just out of curiosity, cause I'm completely unaware. Like I Zoom all the time cause I teach online and stuff like that. But when you guys don't use Zoom, where do you guys meet for the monthly meeting? Oh, when we're not virtual, we meet at RIT in the winter time and we'll meet at the uh, Ferris Center in the but like now during COVID, where do you guys, do you guys still meet? So we, we were, we made at the, the big blue button. We, we were still virtual. So, so the big blue, what? It's a, it's a, it's another um, meeting tool called big blue button. Now tonight we had a, a major, major fault where the uh, audio wasn't working. No matter who went on, the audio did not work. So. Uh, but we, we do meet at the open houses too. But we do. Yes. Okay, well, houses. while COVID's going on, could somebody send me information on how to hook up with that? I would love to just keep coming to these meetings. It's so much fun. This was like so unexpected, and it just popped up in my email, and I was like, "Woohoo!" <laughs> uh, so you should. Well, I send out an invite. Um, the uh, it's it's in it's in the newsletter, but I'll send the invite out with the link uh, on uh, the Monday before and the Friday of the. Uh, you just meeting. send it out to the regular ASRAS mailer? Yeah, the ASRAS uh, Google groups. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll have to see why I'm, I'm not just not noticing them. I don't know. I get so much email coming in my inbox yeah. that I might have missed it. But, um, but it'll, co it'll come directly from me, David. So you'll, you'll, you should see that from me. Okay, cool. The invite. And it's the same link every time. We don't change it. We haven't had to change it. Awesome. So if you if you were to bookmark it, you could come in on the first Friday of the month and just just join right like that. It hasn't changed. Cool. I'll keep my, keep all my right. fingers awesome. crossed. It's so nice seeing all you people. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot like Zoom. It's very similar to Zoom. We just had a had an issue, and I just I just heard that it's it's been fixed, but it's a little late for that now. So. <laughs> <laughs> But thanks, Craig, for hosting us. Appreciate that. Uh, it was a good, uh, a good fallback. My pleasure. Can always be a backup. Appreciate that. All right. Anything else? It's good to see some smiling faces. Even Larry's. I see Larry's smiling face. <laughs> Larry the Bulldog. Mark, you could uh, tell David that the past meetings are available. If he wants oh. to look at the past meetings. Yeah, so Dave, I'll, I'll send you a link, uh, a page of links to our, actually, you can go to our website. They're all right there. If you go to the, uh, the Azraz website, retroastronomy.org, yep. uh, if you look around in there, there's a listing with links to all of our past meetings that we've recorded since last April. Yeah, I believe it's under resources. There you go. There's the guy that knows. All right, cool. I will go and check that out. Wow, there's Don Chamberlain. Oh, my God. I haven't seen you in so long, dude. <laughs> this is so cool smartest people on the planet right here that's it yeah that's true here <laughs> <laughs> i'm not including myself i just like tagging along with you guys yeah i was about to say i was about to meet myself so it would be good <laughs> Well, I have a question. Who's got an astronomy shirt on today? Anybody? No. Nope. Nope. Technically, I have my planetarium shirt. There you go. You got your sure. whole tongue shirt. Bob, you got an astronomy shirt on? We saw you take it off. What do you got on there? I can't <laughs> see it. 
It's 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 a mosquito. It's out working outside astronomy shirt. It's oh, no okay. label. All right. Does anybody know what this is? This shirt. Ah. I'm what trying is that? To... You're kind of blanking out. It looked like Serenity, but not That's what so it much. is. That's what it is. Serenity. That's what it is. Woohoo! Nice. First try. I win. I don't even know what is that? You ever see the series Firefly? Best sci-fi series ever. Oh. In 2003, it only ran for one season. Uh, oh. There was a, it was like a, it was a combination space western. I guess would be the best. It's way like to Gunsmoke it. meets Star Wars yeah. meets Stargate. It's, it's an awesome show. The actors were great. The writing was phenomenal. Nathan Fillion was uh, the, oh, the lead okay. character. And uh, uh, what's her name? She's married to uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, can't think of her name. Gina Which one? Tor Gina Torres is his uh, like first mate. Oh, it's, a, it's a great story. It's a really fantastic story. So I, I yeah, highly if, recommend. If you guys ever get a chance to watch Firefly, I highly recommend yeah, it. I, th I think it's on Hulu. You can watch Firefly. It, really? It's the only okay. sci-fi show. It's the only sci-fi show my wife ever watched with me, and we've watched it several times. Yeah. Hmm. Great story. There's a good cameo uh, actors. Ah, uh, there you go, Joe. <laughs> awesome, Joe. There it is. There That's it is. Right there. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's the ship. That's cool, Joe. <laughs> I they're the geek. <laughs> got them all. <laughs> Joe's, Joe's got more chachi seen? than anybody I know. Cool. We started. We started watching that one, WandaVision. Let's, let's you seen that one? Oh, WandaVision. WandaVision. Wanda, I haven't watched WandaVision yeah. yet. I think they got like seven episodes. And one and, and if any of you have have any of you ever seen the movie called The Dish? I've not seen The Dish. Look it up. It's um Fantastic. oh what's her Same name? Deal. Silence of the Lambs. She was in Silence of the Lambs. What's her name? Jodie Foster. Yeah, yeah, she's in it. No. No, no, she's in contact. No, she's not in it. Contact. Um, I'm sorry. Sam Neill is in it. It's oh. about the uh dish down in Sydney, Australia that would take over the, the space mission when yeah. it went out of our range. It is a so funny, but yet so good at the same time. Very well written. If you ever oh, want to wow. see a really good show, it's called The Dish. Is it on a particular uh, platform right now? I, I I don't know. I just download the torrent and watch it. And, ah, okay. but it <laughs> I'll check it out. But yeah, if you, if you can find it, definitely okay. watch it. It will... Shiny. It brings tears to my eyes because it brings back so many fond memories of somebody long past, and it's just an awesome show. Hmm. Check it out. Good. Yeah. I just saw your shiny Paula. That's great. <laughs> shiny. What does that mean? It's it's something that uh, I forgot her name. She was the mechanic on the. Um, oh the yes, parade. yes, yes. She would always say shiny. <laughs> Gall rabbit. Oh, what was her name? Jewel. Jewel. Yeah, Jewel. Yeah, Jewel. Yeah, and there's also a, a like I said, they when they canceled the show, they they opted to bring it back because the fans had such a fit that they canceled the show, but then they opted for a movie. Which I wish they would have brought the series back, but they opted for a movie. And it's called Serenity. Yeah. Which is really, it's really well done, but I would have rather had another two or three se seasons. Yeah, the, only, the only problem with the movie is they killed too many characters. <laughs> yeah. Anybody seen Resident Alien yet? No? I haven't seen Resident Alien. Resident Alien, it, Walsh is the alien. He, come, he comes to Earth and he's an alien, but he's disguised as a human. Do you guys remember who Walsh is from Firefly? If you've watched Firefly, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's he's cool. the he crashes to Earth. He's the alien. He was actually the, the premise of the show is he's bringing a doomsday device to destroy humankind because there's such a disaster in the universe. But his ship crashes and now he's stuck on Earth. It's pretty funny. It's it's really good. If you get a chance to look it up, it's it's good. It's Resident Alien. I've seen that around. I haven't, looked, I haven't watched it yet. Pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm waiting with bated breath the final season of Expanse. The final season? 
I just saw season five. Isn't it one? Is it, is it the final season? Is six going to be the final? I don't know. But the, the, the next season of Expanse. Final. Yeah, Expanse is another one that's just very well done. Very well Incredibly written. well written. Incredibly well written. So yeah, six will, Paula says, confirmed six will be the last one. I thought it was going to be the last one. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a well done show. And the, the graphics in that are just absolutely phenomenal. If anybody's into 3D modeling, those guys went like over the top with their graphics it's a great story too they really did a, a really tight job of store of uh, story writing of course you got the books to work on i guess yeah I read but the, the, the way they built the characters up though was just unbelievable in this show we're also about, sci-fi geeks how about the uh the new lost in space anybody watching that yep then the two like seasons, two are they coming are they coming There's, out with the third season supposed to be it was supposed to be a third and i think the third is the last one they're going to do yeah, I figured COVID probably nipped that in the bud for right now. So it seems like so long since the last season. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's been a while. Do and catch up. It, it's it, for those of us that have watched the old Lost in Space. It's very different. They totally reworked it, but they did a really good job of reworking it. Oh, I love the robot. The robot's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, the robots. Are, well, what was? Remember the the uh, Penny's monkey? What the heck was its name in the original one? Hmm, Penny's monkey. Blarp. What was it? Blarp. Yeah. Blarp. Like they don't have it this time. I was like, oh, where's the monkey? Maybe we'll see it. Next. Yeah, you actually won't see it now. Just... Oh my god, I'm dating that. myself. I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, I had only heard of the Expanse recently, and I think I. I binged it in a week, the whole five seasons. Whole, oh, did you? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. That, that's, that's, that's good. In a week? That's good. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any previous yeah. engagements. Well, my son would come over to watch the every episode of season five. Yeah, we, we binged the first three because they released the, the first three episodes in season five. And then we had to wait each week for the next one to come out. Yeah, I, and, I literally, like, because the way they did it this time, they didn't release the whole season all at once. I just waited until it was all done so then I could okay. watch it. I think Joe should have an Expanse watch party at the Dome. And well, we could all come down and watch it on the Dome. Well, we could do that, absolutely. Or, um, so I, I'm running the tech also for the local movie theater in town. So uh, we, I can I got the oh, keys. Yeah. <laughs> so I can digitize oh, it and put it on the big screen. Uh, there you go. Theater 4K. Yeah. Uh, have a firefly yeah. party. Yeah, oh, that would be awesome. That would be fun to do. That would be fun to do. How about that other movie that was just on recently? Maybe Netflix about going to Mars. Oh, I saw. Was that the and one? That, it was like, like a. This, it, was like a do, it was like a docudrama. Oh, that was called. Yeah, it was really good. It was. What was that? It was called Mars. I forget the name of it. It's called Mars. It was. It was basically a documentary. I don't about think it was just Mars. called Mars. Yeah. Well, it was cool. like it, um, it's about uh, like was... really it's about the crew and you know it's sort of like an international crew on board and um, I forget the I forget the actress that's like the the commander of the ship, but they all have like these internal struggles. It was a little bit about them, you know. But, you know, then they, I guess not to ruin it for anybody, but they land, they get to Mars. <laughs> and now we're waiting for uh, season two to come back, to come on. It was super good. It was really uh, good. There, there was a, that, that's not the one, there was a, you know, that sounds interesting, obviously, but there was a movie on, on Netflix where it was like, kind of like a docudrama where it was like part the crew going to Mars and the captain ends up dying, but then at the same time, it's like how NASA interacted with them as they were going to Mars. It, no, it was, I, it I know was, which one you're talking about. Yeah, because then I they see were not talking the, about the, the present day and show where we are now, and then they would go back to 2033. Right. To them, yeah. Oh, no. I think that's that not was me. the one. It was just called Mars. Yeah, it, it, it was a good show. It was well done. Um, you know, but. My wife, of course, being yeah, smarter than me. Sure, of him. That's where he dies in the. 
He dies. Yep. yep. And, well, and like I said, episode. I'm not that, that's not that's not a spoiler. That's not a spoiler <laughs> though. My, no, it happens in the first ten minutes. <laughs> no, but that that that's not the spoiler alert. But my wife ruined it for me, like twenty <laughs> minutes into the show. She picked out how it was going to end to a T and oh. I won't tell anybody what it is, but she ruined it for me through the whole show. I'm like, you know, when it was all done, I'm, I just look at it. It's like, you suck. You just ruined the whole show for me. Cause now I knew that's what was going to happen at the end. Uh, I'm yeah. going to look up that movie I'm talking about. So has anybody really gone out and done any observing lately when it is clear? I don't observe. I'm an astrophotographer, but I have been getting data on the uh, Heart Nebula and Malat 15. Nice. nice. <clears throat> yeah, the, the last public event I did was back in early, early spring 2020. I went to the Hannaford's parking lot in Clinton, New York, and pulled my telescope out just because I could, because it was such a nice night. We had a, a quarter moon and a couple of the planets up. And I had more people come up and see, I had almost 40, 50 people come up and come look through my telescope. I was like completely overwhelmed. I was just like, wow, yeah. I haven't done this in so long. And people are still interested. They still like looking up. Yeah, it's great. You know, just to jump in like that Netflix movie is called, or a series is called Away. And Hillary oh, Swank yeah. is like the lead actress in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Vicky, did you, Vicky, Bob here finally <laughs> just got in, but that actually is canceled, sadly. Oh, man. Oh, no. I uh, know. That was such a well done thing, and I was really looking forward oh, to the second shit. season and gone. Yeah, was that's it on why Netflix? it's. Yeah, uh, yeah, Netflix or Prime or one of those. And uh, yeah, Netflix. yeah it, it's. Not it's tough to get into some of those shows because you never have any idea when they're going to cancel something. You're like, oh. I, I never can figure that out. Yet all these cooking shows that are absolutely ridiculous still survive. I know. doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody's right. got to eat. <laughs> That's true. That's why yeah, I have a but... cake, Mama. I have a feeling oh, that probably wow, cost a lot of money and, uh, and they just decided it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Beyond anymore. I know. It was, but the first season was great. At least they made it. First season was great, and at least yeah, right. At least they made it. <laughs> well, I have to, I'll have to go look that up. It's like a lot of suspense. It's like super good. Yeah, it's worth the first year, even though you know it's canceled. It really is. Oh shoot! Oh well. Yeah. Well, I yeah. Uh, I watched the first uh, season of Picard. In fact, I, yeah. I did the the um, love that show. Uh, mm -hmm. I did the CBS Prime for the free month and watched all of Picard. And I thought, and it was a great ending. I mean, it's a good first season. It's it all it's all kind of self-contained, and you can see it going on from there. But it's very, very well done. That is, that is a good show. I watched it all the way, all, all the seasons that they put out there. It was really good and really well done. So, and since we're all stuck at home, what else are we going to do? You know? <laughs> What'd you say, Vic? <laughs> Picard. Picard. Picard with the P. Like, how do you spell this word? P Picard. I C A R D. The captain. Make of it the, so. Uh, captain of the uh, Enterprise D. You yes. know, what? I never really watched this show. Well, Star you got Trek something Next to do now. Oh, now you got Star something. You got to watch. Star you got to watch Star Trek Next Generation. It's the I best series of Star Trek. Trek at all. I don't know. No? Oh, Vicky, no, oh, no. Come no, on. Like you let me down. Who likes astronomy that hasn't watched Star Trek. So, so in order to watch Picard, you have to have watched the movies because it does, it picks right. up right where the last movie ended. So. Well, you actually and you actually have to watch the series too to understand all the dynamics of it. Oh, forget it. <laughs> Come on. What else Vicky, you what I don't else you going to be friends COVID? anymore? <laughs> it's only seven seasons with like that's 25 all. episodes each season. That's right. Nice and easy. Seven seasons and four movies you got to watch. It should have started yeah, but yeah, like March. But, yeah, I bet you, but I bet you if it was Star Wars, you would watch it all the way through, right? I'm probably the only person no. here that doesn't really care for Star Wars. Don't judge our face. I, don't watch, I never watched Star Wars either. I saw like the first one, maybe the second. I'm not really sure, but I watched I them know. all because Joe was such a diehard Star Wars fan. Yeah, see, I'm going to get oh, it now. Nice there lightsaber is. there. there is. 
surprised no one's actually mentioned the Mandalorian so far. I mean, that that really was uh, an excellent Star Wars series. That that was Whether a good you like series. It or not. Yeah. Yeah, Mandalorian was good. That too. They're filming yep. season three coming up in May. Is that yep. I keep track of them all. Uh, Mandalorian. What is that one on? It's on Disney Plus. Uh, Disney Plus. You're right, Mark. Yep. On oh, Disney Plus. I don't have that. And yeah, I haven't seen Mandalorian. So cool. I don't have Disney Plus. <laughs> Just well, so you guys I have know. It digitized. We watch in the theater. Just oh, so yeah. you guys all know. <laughs> a lot of you don't know my past, but. Um, most some of you do but I was in the Rochester area for the longest time and like it was so great to be able to go to all these Astros meetings and like get your geek on because everybody there would listen to you with bait on bated breath like talking about geeky star things and neutrinos mm -hmm. and stuff like that and now I live in Clinton New York where nobody cares I have no <laughs> audience whatsoever and I never get to talk astronomy I never get to talk geek you know, my daughter rolls my eyes at me. My wife is like, yeah, whatever. This is such an awesome night for me. I just want to tell you guys how much fun I'm having. You do have good pizza in Clinton, New York, though. We do. We do. We have the best pizza in Clinton, New York. Yeah, good, good pizza. Where Utica. is Clinton, New York? Near Utica. You know where Hamilton College Hamilton is? Hamilton College. That's it. No, but okay. I'm, I'm about I'm about 25 minutes away from Hamilton, New York, where Joe's at at Colgate University, and I'm right next to Utica, New York. Ten minutes okay. away from Utica. But I live Dude, in this little village. We, we, call it, we, we call it the bubble. I haven't owned a key to my house in 16 years. I don't even know where the keys to my house are because we never oh, well, lock our nice. house. It's just a peaceful mm -hmm. little place. It's got a village green with the gazebo and everybody knows exactly what I'm doing every single moment of the day. If I don't, if I go somewhere, my neighbors call my wife and said, did you know David left the house today? <laughs> <laughs> they just let her know where I'm at all the time. Because I work from home, so they don't expect <laughs> me to leave ever. So. It's a nice place to live. Huh? But like I said, Sounds I, do, nice. I do miss my ass-ass geeky friends that will talk science. And uh, you, you don't know how much this means right now. <laughs> <laughs> it means a lot for all of us. We're all stuck inside. So That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like it's I said, my, my only escape has been, like I said, I started winter hiking, and that's been my only escape because nobody else wants to go out when it's like eight degrees and hike up a trail with five feet of snow. <laughs> but you know, being right next to the Adirondacks, it's it's a nice nice escape. That's great. Yeah, you're close by. Mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a long drive to get to where you want to be. In the if you see my background, if you see my background, that's yeah. where I go hiking. Right. This just happens to be fall. Flying my drone. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's well, guys, nice. I remember when I first started coming to, like, um, I went, like, when I first moved here and I found out that um, there was an astronomy club and I started going to some star parties. And one of the first people I met was Frank Bob. And uh, I remember, like, telling my friends, Oh my God, I met like people who actually want to talk about the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> like, because nobody ever knew what I was talking about, you know? Exactly. And I was like, it's so wonderful. I'm like so happy. <laughs> and so, yeah, I totally get what you're saying because uh, it's nice to be among your peers, you know? Like, not that I certainly, no, like I'm not on the same level as really anyone there. I was basically such a beginner, just like an enthusiast, you know, but not like, um, I don't really know that much about it, but I just love it. And I think it, that's, what, that's what we have here is a whole lot of enthusiasts. I don't think we yeah, all know I mean, a lot about anything. But. Yeah, I mean, I just love being around it and, you know, learning all the time. So the, the stories I could tell you about the, the wonderful great. people that I met through ASRAS that basically welcomed me and my daughter with open arms. I was 28, 29 with a six-year-old daughter who was very precocious and we joined the club and were welcomed with open arms and just had the time of our lives. I was a single parent and you know Dave Bishop was a godsend. 
because I had this brand new Celestron telescope and had no idea how to point it anywhere in the night sky with the equatorial mount. And he literally, an entire star party sat with me the whole entire night and showed me how everything worked. And that's Carolata, I don't know if she's still here, but she could attest to the whole thing. She was a witness to it all. It was an amazing event and it moved on through the years where I actually became the secretary and vice president of the astronomy club way back in the day and actually ended up on the astronomy of the year plaque in 2001 i think something mm -hmm. like that but it was like i said it was just such a great group of people and I, I needed something i could do with my daughter that you know wasn't involved with tea parties and stuff like that because my daughter would have nothing to do with that and it was just so awesome they treated her like an adult but yet she could be in a kid at the same time such a great group. But you guys used awesome. to intimidate me so badly. People said, oh, it's all professors and PhDs and everything. But no, you guys <laughs> welcomed me with open arms. And I haven't met any of you yet. I've only been to like four virtual meetings so far. But um, mm -hmm. I've been in my, my father, actually, he got a PhD in physics and astronomy at U of R in 1958. I remember he did his thesis on R.R. Lyrae. Um, and mm. so I was brought up from a kid, you know, with my dad teaching me the constellations. And then I was in the junior section of the um, RAS um, with Kevin Lyons and some other people when I was in high school. And then I went away to Cleveland. I've been gone and I don't have a telescope anymore. And so back in Rochester, going to buy a telescope, found you guys. Yay. Hey, Paula, did you do that painting behind you? Yes, I did. Oh, it's really nice. I did. Cool. Thank you. I've got, there's like a couple. Oh, cool. The whole, the whole house. <laughs> oh, that's great. Good for yeah. you. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really pretty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was a lot of talent. Things. Yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry. I, oh. I, gave up on, I gave up on stick figures. That's where I, I, was, I was a, a musician actually for 25 years. I was the principal flute in the Cleveland Opera and the Cleveland Ballet. And then I just got burned out being out every night and, you know, having to come home at midnight on the dark streets, find my car and get panhandled. And I finally just had it. I wanted to be able to put my kid to bed at night. So mm -hmm. I, I just, that's it. I'm going to do something else. So I started painting. It's great. Great. Cool. It's, it's like a great cool. choice. Yeah, that's what oh, I did. That's is what that I did acrylics? Really with, uh, yes. with, with um, photography. I, years ago, I, I changed. I, I was classically trained as a, as a carpenter, as a cabinet maker, furniture maker. And uh, I got burned out on that as well. I didn't want to be carrying doors up three flights of stairs at 55, 60 years old, I, you know, I changed careers right. radically and, and got into photography and, and uh, eventually became a professional photographer, portrait photographer. And uh, I, I didn't want to get burned out on that either. So I dove headlong deep into the rabbit hole that is astrophotography. Yeah. <laughs> <Deep hole. laughs> it's, astrophotography it, I haven't definitely... found the bottom yet. <laughs> and astrophotography is definitely a deep hole. I, I started with, uh, some of you may remember Andy Chapman. Yep. He now lives in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up starting side by side. He had way more money than anybody should rightfully have to get into this equipment. And I had nothing. And he would constantly ridicule me standing next to me telling people like, you know, he would say like, now I could do my drive and move to any object I want. While Dave over there has to like, pull his telescope over and line it up with star charts and everything like that but then i can just punch it in and zoom right to it and i'll never forget the day he was doing this with like because we had like a visitor's night out at the asras or that ionia and he's going on like all night long just kept haggling me about how lame i was because i had to do everything manually using setting circles or star charts or whatever to find my way around and he would just punch in a number and get to it so I finally went over and I just, I said, but there's one thing that Andy lacks that I don't. And I kicked this plug out of the socket and said, 
Andy's now stuck for the next 25 to 30 minutes to realign his telescope. So if you want to see anything, you have to come over to my telescope to look at everything because he's got to realign everything up because he really doesn't know where anything is in the night sky. But any, if any of you know Andy Chapman, you know, look him up on the internet. This guy does phenomenal work. He's in Thailand. He's got yeah. the most amazing equipment you've ever seen. If you uh, if you search uh, dark or uh, master darks, master darks, uh, yes. yep. website, and uh, he's on Facebook as well as it, you look at the website, and uh, he hosts um, imagery from a, a, a number of uh, astrophotographers, and it is phenomenal. And you get wow. to see his site there in Thailand, and uh, he's got some equipment there that's just he found. He, he's close to the bottom of the hole, but he's still not there. <laughs> yeah, he's, but he's close. I mean, he's got hundreds it's of like, thousands of dollars invested. It's like hard to believe. Yeah, that's that his cousin, by the way. Yes. The yes. You know? What's that, Victory? Um, it's like hard to believe that those images like originate on Earth, you know? Like, yeah. they're just so yeah, amazing. amazing. You think it's like a Hubble image or something, and it's no, nope, well, taken that, from an observatory in Thailand. I mean, it's and that's crazy. the thing that blows my mind is that NASA will call Andy to verify images that they took, and mm -hmm. they will compare mm -hmm. them against his to make sure that they're accurate. What? Pretty cool. And I remember when he just had his Mead uh, twelve-inch telescope. <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting, I'm, I'm sitting there with my Celestron eight-inch, and we would like be going at it with each other all night long. Great guy, though. He's a great guy. Yeah, we miss him too. Definitely. Yeah. He was around, usually, remember, a couple of years ago? He well, came he, from the... Uh, he, usually uh, usually comes the home every, he usually comes home every August, but obviously this year with yeah. COVID, that didn't happen, so... Yeah, that was kind of fun. And yeah. I don't know how many of you guys remember Melissa, my daughter. What a trip she took. <laughs> yeah, she actually went and, and visited Andy in Thailand and stayed wow. at... It's basically what's called the palace. Like a Andy lives a, a I, I just say a, Andy lives a gifted life. And she's like, she's like, yeah, I kind of lost it when the guy came in and, and my shoe was untied and he offered to tie my shoe for me. And I'm like, um, I can tie my own shoe, buddy. Back off. <laughs> That's cool. Let's go. But I used anyway, to think of like, else? remember when um, we had the star parties like at Mandan? It used to get to be like that after a while, like it would be a contest, you know, like somebody would be looking at the ring nebula and then somebody would be like, I've got it over here. <laughs> and then everybody would like go over to that scope and like see, and, they, and then someone on the other side would say, you got to see it through my scope. <laughs> Oh yeah. It would be so yeah. much fun. It would be like this whole like competition, you know, about like does, who could does get Jim the best Sido, image. Does Jim Sidawan still do the telescope, the, the star parties? Yeah. Well, we we can't because of COVID, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're mm -hmm. chopping at the bit to get back and doing star parties mm -hmm. again. Because like yeah. there used to be this thing, like we always used to, you know, everybody's got their go-to telescopes. And I always have a I always took advantage of having a gym too. I had Jim Sidawan and he would just find anything you wanted to find faster than your your go-to scope could that guy <laughs> knew everything in the night sky i learned so much from him yeah he's good and he had all the unique names for all the different galaxies like they would be called ngc something but he was like no this is the pencil neck geek galaxy <laughs> <laughs> you know i think it was ngc uh 281 or something like that it was a, a edge on spiral um but he had like very unique names but man that guy had everything in his head He's yeah, Mr. Pied Piper of Rochester Astronomy. That's what I always say about him. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> yeah. That's what I always tell everyone. It's like, you know, I, I have a push to. That's my that's my guide scope. I push my scope wherever it needs to go. And I got star charts. <laughs> hey, I got to go, but it was fun. Thank you so much again. All right, Joe. Joe, thank Joe, you we'll so have much. To hook, time. Joe, we'll have to hook up soon. I got to come out Absolutely. to the planetarium. Come on, anytime. All right. Thank you, guys, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. It was a good meeting. Yeah. All right, guys. I think I'm going to bow out too. Uh, I got some Stargate episodes I need to go watch before I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everyone. Better, Dave. Hey, see you later, guys. Hey, this was a whole lot of fun. This that we're having afterwards. Awful. Yeah, this is great. This is what yeah, we all. This great. is what we all miss.
Hey, Good Don, to see you all. I missed you at Menden this year. Oh, yeah. Well, hey. No. We, we were talking our, before we about us. have we seen anything. I have not looked through a telescope since probably November 19 or in 2019. Yikes. Yeah. I have and been gone was, a whole year. And then you oh. probably saw Pluto that year. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Probably the last thing I saw through a telescope was Pluto, too. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> All right, Dave. Yeah, very good. I'm going to leave you. Bye now. All right, guys. Bye. All right, everyone. See you. Girls. See you, everybody. <laughs>